So I suggest, so I, I suggest we, we do the, the final part now. There is already beer prepared. And so the beer is not far away, also here. Um, we have, um, let's say, one good talk about these probes things from this morning. Remember about this kind of uh, dynamic data or on the way, let's say, uh, new gold. In the way. Then we have also uh, advice about the hackathon from Jonas. And then I will talk a bit uh, about the idea or that we will talk about setting up an, an association here. We, we can try if this one is better or this one. I don't know. I'll, I'll take the <coughs> mobile one. OK, good. So I'll take a little bit, talk a little bit about what was earlier in the opening panel on how to build maps based on sensor data. So I think that's one thing that I'm really, really actively working on. And a little bit of background, I've been working on that very, very long. So I've been a co-founder of an OpenStreetMap-based navigation company called Scobbler here out of Berlin. And we've been last year acquired um, from Telenav, basically for our OpenStreetMap navigation assets. And um, what we've been working on really is like in order to like how can we get like the OpenStreetMap and maps in general to be like automotive grade so that it can be really used in cars and what's really the next challenges for that. And I want to provide a little bit of background into that. So the very interesting thing is that the map landscape is really massively changing. So we've seen that historically, basically, there was like two big mapping companies. There was TomTom, Tom, and there was, at that time, basically, Navtech, or Teleatlas and Navtech, which was now uh, TomTom Tom and here, basically. But nowadays, it's completely shifting. Nowadays, like a lot of technology companies understand that owning a map and having really a map is like a crucial asset to them. So we see that. Apple has now their own um, mapping vehicles which are driving through the United States and other countries to set up these as assets. Tesla has seen that they could only build the autopilot function of their cars because they start to build their own maps. So really every Tesla in the world is, is basically creating its own maps while it's going. And Uber was trying to buy here, but as they didn't succeed, basically they like, set up their own team to create their maps and bought the mapping assets from Microsoft. And here was acquired by the German car makers because they don't want to be le left in the background when Google is developing their own self-driving vehicles because they understand that owning map data is key to having self-driving cars. And I mean, Google is, of course, the most ambitious of all of them. So they have stated very clearly, so Chris Ernson uh, always says that like, he wants to have self-driving cars in the road within four years in production so that his son doesn't need to make a driving license anymore. And all of that is powered by high-precision mapping. So, the most important thing to understand is that the map of the future is very, very different from what it is right now. I mean, basically, if you look at a current map, then more or less it's like a digital transformation of the paperback map. I mean, it's still fairly static. I mean, the map doesn't really change. You maybe have a couple of layers like traffic, parking spots, as we've just heard in the presentation, other things on top of it. But fundamentally, it's still the very, very same map that we used to have in paperback format, now just in digital format with a little bit of more information. But in the future, the map is becoming a really much more critical asset to all the things. So first of all, there's a couple of big, big trends. So the one big trend is that the map is becoming dynamic. So what you see is, for example, things like dynamic speed limits. When you see on the motorway posted that right now you're allowed to drive 120 here, that's there. You see that dynamic information, even like the, the cycles of, uh, tra of red light cameras are in there, so that you know exactly if you drive with this speed, then you will like pass the traffic light when it's green and you will like save a lot of energy. So you see that also the infrastructure is communicating back to the map. So this is the dynamization of the map then this, and, and weather data and all this kind of things. The second big thing which you see is that the map is um, used for safety functions. So you see for autonomous driving, for e-horizon, basically a lot of safety functions rely on the map. So there, like, you need a very different precision than when you need normally for guidance. In guidance, when you say, like, turn right in 50 meters, it doesn't really matter if it's off by one or two meters. But if the vehicle uses the map to safely um, navigate you across the street, it's very, very critical if it tells you, like, this is, like, one or two meters off. So I think this is, like, the precision for the safety functions require often, like, 10 centimeter accuracy. And this is like if you consider that you have sensors like GPS who are very far from having 10 centimeter accuracy, then that's very, very hard to get because like 
right now, none of the location sensors that are deployed in large scales allow this 10 centimeter accuracy. So that's the second big thing that just gets used for safety functions. And the third thing is also that there's really a big advent of new functionality that is used by that. So you see that like usage-based insurances or car sharing or so on rely on them. And they also have very unique requirements in terms of like how the maps function. So, and the most important thing which I want to say is that I think we've been like waiting for that for ages. So we've waited for, for maps to power our self-driving vehicles. And I think we're like always talking about this big vision that the car makers say, yeah, 2025 we'll have like some self-driving vehicles. But I think then what happened this year, just a few months back, is because everybody was talking for the very, very long time. But now we see that uh, Tesla is basically leapfrogged everybody and just like, they just like ignore all regulations and introduce their, their autopilot. And I want to, like, if you haven't seen it, if it would be online here, then I would show this video. But otherwise, you'll take a look. But I can tell you, I tested it myself in, in California and drove in a Tesla with an autopilot. And the really big game changer is that what they did is, I like, think, exactly the same vision that we have. They make every Tesla car into a mapping vehicle. So even like cash rich companies like Google, and Apple, they have maybe hundreds or here, they have like hundreds of, um, and they have hundreds of mapping vehicles which go all around the world and map it. So even in a really good situation, you might have that like one of these mapping vehicles passes your address maybe like once a year, twice a year, maybe four times a year if you're in a really, really high frequency spot. But you need to know that about 10% of the map information changes every single year. It's not that like all the details change, but let's say from a street, the speed limit changes, a turn restriction changes, direction of flow changes. So that is true for 10% of all the segments in the map. So that means like if you go only like twice a year, what the big companies do, you have like on average like 5% of your map information at any given time is wrong. If you exclude anything like that you map something wrong, just by this time effect, you have like 5% is wrong by the time that the map reaches you, which is like quite horrible. Of course, not everything will be wrong, but some information. And so what Tesla does with its autopilot, basically you see that the map, that the car senses its environment and then uploads this to the Tesla cloud. And people have saying like that areas where the autopilot didn't work very reliably, after they drove past it like 10, 20 times, suddenly the autopilot functioned. So this is like the whole thing that like Tesla has now the most mapping vehicles in the world. It's not here, it's not Uber. Tesla has the most mapping vehicles. They have like 100,000 mapping vehicles on the road. And that's really what the, what the future of map creation is when it's not anymore about this high powered like 80,000 euro LIDARs on top of the car, but when it's really about like every car in the world creates this map. And I think community have to really take part in something that's uh, really transforming the society. And I mean, I think Tesla is quite bold with this. I'm also quite shocked because I mean, we almost crashed with our Tesla when we let it self-drive. But we hope that it would only crash once at that spot. So after we have like crashed a couple of times, hopefully there will be no further Teslas crashing at the same spot because they're learning while they're driving. So, like, so on our cases, like this is the kind of how we look like the, the, the map of the future. And it has a couple of aspects. So on the one side, basically, you have all the environment data. So you have like the base layer of the map, which is the streets and the road networks and all that data. You have data from the, uh, from the real-time data from the driving environment, you have things like traffic lights, dynamic speed limits, and then you have like data like parking availability and traffic, of course. So you have like all this kind of environment data which will be fed into the car and which will be put on top of the real-time so that you exactly know where's the traffic at a certain situation, where's the uh, traffic uh, lights red, where there's parking available, as we just heard. So all of that is environment data. And then we have on the one side also personal data. Because the most important thing is like why right now people use like 10% of their driving time they use navigation systems. Why don't you use navigation system? Because people are always upset when you go from work to home, your navigation system delivers you the route that the navigation think is, system thinks is the smartest route. But you have like your own idea which roads you want to take. So that's why you don't do that. So what do we do, for example? We like track where you're driving. And if you're really driving 10 times the same road, then in our navigation system, we put a preference on it and say like, OK, actually, our system thinks it's not the best road. But since you really believe it's the best one, we'll like put our route closer to that. And only if there's a really big congestion or big incident, we route, route you around it. So one part is like your personal driving. And then there's other things. There's your calendar, which know, uh, tells you where to go at a certain time, your messages where you do other things, or your emails. 
So this is all your personal data, which we believe also belongs on there because it has a high relevancy to tell you like when you need to go somewhere. And then we have the data out of the car. So fundamentally, we believe there's three big types of data that you need to get out of every car to make that happen. And I mean, Tesla has, has two out of them, but I think it's basically three big data uh, streams that you need. So the one thing is you need to have a GPS in the car. So you need to have the position from the car in an as precise as possible way. So that's the most important sense. So this is GPS-based probes, which you can use to like track anything. The second big th system which you need to have is camera. Because no matter how many probes you have, without a camera, some things you can't see. You can't see a house number based on a GPS position. If you have a camera, you can like film it and you can record it. And then there's a third big sensor, which is a lot of controversy around, which is a LiDAR sensor, which is basically the same sensor that you have in your Kinect that you can build a 3D point cloud of everything around you. So I think this is also what you fundamentally need, in my opinion, to build a self-driving car. Elon Musk makes the point that you don't need that and it's too expensive. Um, and I think, I mean, fundamentally you don't need it because we as humans have two eyes and we see and obviously we can drive without having a LiDAR. So fundamentally it needs to be a solvable problem. But on the other hand, it makes it so much easier and companies in Silicon Valley work now, like Quanergy, for example, works now to build a $50 LiDAR and that just makes the problem so much easier. So then you basically have a full representation of where people drive, you have a full visual representation with camera systems of the world, and basically with the LiDAR you have a full 3D representation of everything, all the obstacles around you. And that's what we believe if you have this data and all the cars are connected to the cloud, and that's basically how you do that. So this is basically things that we already do. So I think we have systems with GPS probes where we see like, okay, this is like an existing road, and then basically when cars are starting to drive, then we see, okay, there's people driving, there's no road below it, so like flag it immediately in this case to the OpenStreetMap community and have it mapped. So that's the one thing. Then the second thing is like camera systems. So we have developed an image recognition technology. While you're driving, it films across the road, and then if it sees a speed limit, it compares it with the map data. If it's not the same, it uploads it to the cloud, and in this case, we also flag it to the OpenStreetMap community to fix it. This is a more research project which we do with one of the car makers, where we do the same thing with a, with a LiDAR. We try to like sense your 3D environment and then automatically detect if something is changing. So then we say like, hey, there's like a new, there's new, um, new rail line on the side, there's a new center line of the road. So basically all the same, right? You're always taking the same approach. You like, the image, uh, the vehicle in real time recognizes it, then compares it with the data that it thinks is reality, and as soon as there's a change, it flags it to the cloud, and all the other vehicles behind you map it automatically. So you can consider it just like the same thing as like ant intelligence, basically. So consider that if you're the first driver who sees a new situation, then you're like the ant who discovers something new, and you need to give that information back to the central hive so that all the other vehicles after you don't have the same problem. Because what happens if the map data doesn't match reality, your self-driving car will either ask you to take over, or it will slow down, or it will behave in any other ways not optimal, like the Tesla's right now almost crashing, which is for sure not optimal. Um, and basically this is like what we want to avoid, so that only one person has this problem and all the others coming behind him see that. So that's basically what, what we do. So I just want to give you like a couple of examples. So this is again the example with the GPS probes where we have um, also small animation. So this is how it looks like. We're on the web, we released a tool on Improve OSM where you can see like this is all where people are driving, where there's no road network and then you can zoom in and then you see exactly that's where they're driving. You can put a satellite pictures behind it and then people can map it. So this m is something that we'll like upload on a very regular basis, in this case to the OSM community, but of course the goal long term is to automatically map that. So there you can see that based on people's driving behavior, they automatically improve the map. So basically the people get from like users of the map, they get to people who are improving it. And this is um, in production, so if you want to check it out, it's on improveosm.org, where we have released this tool and a couple of others. Um, this is the second example, which I mentioned earlier. So here we are putting speed limits on the map. So we're having like people driving all around in Berlin, and you can see like, okay, there's all this limits um, scene. So this is basically where our users have driven around with their smartphone because it's very hard to get in cars. So we put a smartphone, you put it on your windshield, it films, then it recognizes the signs automatically, uploads it to the cloud, and we can do two things. One, if we have enough certainty, we can just automatically add it to the map because we know, okay, 10 users have seen that, it's certainly there. Or if not, we can send it to the community, including the image, and they can map it. 
So that's, that's also like where we are heavily working on to inc uh, increase that for other signs, right? I mean, if you imagine if you have the camera, everything that you can detect, you can automatically add to a map. And this is then some things we're working on to recognize also like these kind of signs. So we're working also on OCR software that it can read, okay, if you want to go to Hanover, then you need to drive to the right side. So that's also really very, very fundamental information if you can imagine what can happen. Um, so fundamentally, this is basically the vision that we have. So we call this the living map because that's really where it changes. So we see like at the center of it, it's basically a big technology stack for like processing all this information. And then we give like tools and validation opportunities to the OSM community, which is in over 2 million members right now, which basically like enhance the map for everybody, not only for us. And on the other side, we deploy these changes in, with Delta updates to our vehicles because it's quite fundamental that they really get all those changes. So we work on technology that not like traditional map making only delivers you the map like every few weeks or every few months. And we're working on uh, technology which will be live in 2016 that allows us to do minutely map updates to all the drivers. So basically all the cars will get like every minute when all the um, swarm of other cars see something, they get a new map, basically match it and then like still detect the deltas and upload this back to the crowd. So this is I think how we see like the future of mapping and geo information that you really have the cycle of like people who create the map and people who use the map and they're basically living in symbiosis. In the past you had like really, here does your map and the car makers use it, but fundamentally in the future will be get one big circle um, and that will enable really to take the map to a whole different quality level. I mean that's the big goal to go down from this like 5% error rate that you just statistically have if you go like twice a year down to a much, much lower rate but basically every error that you have or every new construction that you have is detected within like maybe hours or maybe in the future even minutes um, if you have enough vehicles. And if you imagine that we are like talking about an order of like a couple of orders of magnitude increase, if you say that like somebody has right now maybe 100 mapping vehicles and if you see that the big car companies sell like 10 million cars and you equip them all with the sensors, then suddenly even what, uh, what Google is doing right now with this mapping uh, efforts in production looks like kindergarten because now you like deploy like thousands of times more vehicles in the world who are able to build these maps. So, thank you very much. Very good. From the point of view, I think it's <laughs> okay, a bit to the end, but it's uh, very impressive also to see how these developments are. You can already stay here and take seat because we, we're going also more or less to the end. But I think this is really also a model how things can work and connect. Um, it's really also quite of a way maybe how to convert activities. And it's, it's um, very impressive to see also, especially these kind of probes, or this, what I sometimes call this golden, uh, gold, the new gold. So on the one hand side, we can stay here. We still have now only, where is uh, Jonas? Ah, it's already there. So we have a now an announcement. These are just two announcements anymore, so not really talks. Uh, one is about the hackathon, which we are running. And the third idea is that this is why at the very end, um, we, can, we would like to invite you to do something together. But this is, let's say, for the next generation uh, of next platform, smartphones or um, not smart watches, but I think it's a Sony term, so wearables and a general thing. And they already started to hack. If you want to visit them and you want to play also, go into this room behind, there are these people already hacking a bit. So, okay. So I also need to hack the presentation system, so <laughs> I have to use Bitly for transferring it. Um, yeah, um, we have a hackathon running, and it's called Hack the Variable, and um, it's about variables and location. And um, we had like awesome talks today about um, backend uh, systems and, and uh, indoor navigation, and. Uh, why we like this uh, topic at Komoot so much, like um, one of the founders of Komoot, because we're doing outdoor mapping, <laughs> and for uh, people who are not using cars, but like their bike or uh, their legs, 
And uh, so when we started, it was like all about like desktop computers and, and stuff like that and, now, and, and smartphones. But now the dream is coming true. You just have this little device on your wrist and you have like everything in there. You have like from a guide to a full-fledged turn-by-turn navigation system. Um, so we did this for Samsung and Apple Watch and, and Android Wear as well. And uh, so that's why we said like, okay, um, uh, let's do a hackathon, and this was like one of the ideas of um, Roland, and um, and say like, okay, how can we develop really nice products for the user, um, and and um, come closer to the user and um, to their bodies and, and to the risk, <laughs> to the risk. So at the moment, um, um, there are uh, uh, young and. Uh, excellent people um, hacking on this topic and they try to develop apps and um, the deadline is on Saturday and uh, so there will be like an award and like the f team with the first uh, wins the first place gets 2,000 euros and the second place gets 1,000 euros which is uh, quite nice uh, um, but nice award money. Thank you, uh, Berlin Partner, for sponsoring that, and also like the WearCamp, of course, and Sony and and, and Geo Monday for um, the support. Um, so yes, so that's the plan. Let's support the young developers and let's support like the end user products. <laughs> okay. okay um, also, Jan Marsh. You can also come a bit uh, closer. There will be another activity. We can have also a seat already. Um, there was another activity you will get tomorrow here, some 3D printers you will see. And there was an idea to get some money, so we put some money also and said that we got always in buildings. And um, what is the idea to have anywhere, a place in the world, and say this, you would like to print 3D? Simple idea. We realize this. Tomorrow we will have also the um, 3D printers. But also, Jan did this work also, and uh, this is another good opportunity. We will you get more tomorrow the presentation, Jan uh, Marsh, Marsh um, always in buildings. But anyway, come also on the on the share here because one of the very last things and all of the core mappers may can come also. So um, core mappers and core wear campers. Um, please have a seat, Adela also. She's here. Ready? Not yet. Where's Adela? There, there. For instance, come. Yes, we had to move a bit. But um, all of them? All of us? It's very good. You can take also the red one. Just move a bit on this. No, it's not my one. Take for Adela. Is it okay? <laughs> um, so, one of the ideas was that we, we, we had this idea. We met in Stanford, we brought this a bit to Berlin, so we developed this further, and one of the idea was that we start to think to broaden it a bit. So you can be not just participant, we try to, we, we're thinking of, we are thinking very concretely to set up an association for these things. So you can be also then member, not just participant, member of this association. And there could be via different activities, as well I just mentioned, with a 3D printer or the GeoLabs uh, contest, and of course other activities like the Geo Mondays. Also, we get a report. We get also a statement tomorrow from um, Jan uh, Novak about the Geo Mondays, what we do. And if you're interested in this, and I hope many of you are interested also to become a member, go on the website geoit.org. It's also announced on the blog, and there's just a simple list uh, currently. So you being um, on the list, because if you want to start to found this, and this will be quite soon, you'll be part of it. And maybe everybody of us can just give a now statement, why is it worth to work with us? Is it a, an idea and a come around? And we would like to, as I said, invite you and be part of this. Maybe I have spoken enough, that's why I give it to you, <laughs> and I come to you here. Well, I think normally I would start like with uh, offering everybody rich and fame, uh, and I think this is uh, pretty true for everything that's in geo, so I think there's a golden age of geo-information, as we shared before, 
and I think uh, a lot of that will only w happen if we all work together. So I think that's why it's great to have an association supporting that. Yeah, <laughs> no, no more slides, so that's why we could. Um, yeah, like um, I think um, the the whole WareCamp shows that like uh, Berlin is like one of the major uh, major hubs for that, and um, that there's like a lot of possibilities now uh, to explore, and and that's why um, like we have like a nice foundation, but I think we can spread out a bit, uh, much more. Yeah, for me, from let's say from the governmental perspective from the federal states of Berlin and Brandenburg. Uh, it is important for us to, to push some activities to a certain limit and I think uh, we have reached with uh, all our activities in the GEO community, we have reached this certain limit that now it's time to found a, a robust structure to work further. And uh, I think the association is a very good idea uh, everyone can, can become member, we have corporate membership, we have private memberships and uh, hopefully uh, this association will be the host for the next wear camp next year. Oh, this sounds like the wear camp is over, no it's not over. But uh, we, need, uh, we need funding for all the activities and uh, from the association we will uh, push the activities further, we will have Geo Mondays next year also and uh, all ideas are welcome to uh, give the geo community more visibility in the area because uh, maybe you know uh, some some people in the public um, in the public administration think oh geo it it's an old topic it's uh, not very new it's uh, it's a bit dusty and uh, i think the wear camp is uh, the right place to see that it is not a dusty old topic because it is the hottest topic i think in the in the uh, it industry and uh, we had a lot of interesting talks about this and we will have much more interesting talks tomorrow and uh, the results of the hackathon and the association is the right form to uh, give this a more uh, maybe a more typical German structure. Association is a typical German construct but we need such thing to uh, push the activities further. I think uh, like <laughs> my colleague said before it's very important because you can achieve far more working together. Yeah, um, I also see Berlin as a really big hotspot for geo activities, and I think that you know, it could need that frame um, to to bundle all our activities. And I'm also hoping um, that we can better bridge um, the open source communities and the com commercial companies. Um, I see associations on both sides, but nothing really bridging both worlds. And hopefully, we can move a few things there. Yeah, um, I'm now in the geo event side of things since 2011 around. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, when with so many people talked in the past and also today and uh, also seeing many trends which are coming, uh, I think there is no doubt anymore there will be no such company, whoever names it, uh, that can actually have the power to go into the full stack of what uh, GIT in the future will be. I mean, Philip uh, gave us an insight about the sensor. I think always the stressed up buzzword IoT is saying it. Um, the, the stack is even getting bigger. The amount of data is getting bigger. And I think it would be the worst thing if we in Berlin or let's say the, the community around there uh, would do any investment to reinvent the wheel twice. So I think the association paves a good ground for getting people together and also sharing efforts and, and making uh, new corporations possible in a very light wide way. So that's actually my hope for this association. Yeah, I mean, today we talked about positioning, routing, navigation, mapping. I'm coming more from mobile startup background and that's about on-demand services, location-based services, mobile, monetization and I think we are not too far away and these technologies they have to merge and these communities have to talk together and there's a lot of potential and I think the association, I mean, we can create awareness, transparency and I mean, Berlin has a huge ecosystem and a lot of people are not aware of it so it's also about 
yeah, just uh, having a strong opinion and um, showing what's possible with uh, geo IT. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, like I said before, I think we don't do enough of this kind of thing, and uh, that could really help if we were to formalize this a little bit more. Um, I would like to refer to the indoor industry again, where we, Nokia here, um, were the founding members together with companies that you might well consider rivals like Cisco, Sony, Broadcom, Qualcomm, all together, getting together into something called the In-Location Alliance several years ago. Um, it's been incredibly successful for exchanging ideas, for identifying synergies, uh, even, like I said, amongst companies that may otherwise be considered competitors um, to, to achieve something together which is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do here. So um, I think for, for broadening that to a wider geo uh, kind of mapping, both indoor and outdoor world, uh, I think this would make a lot of sense. So uh, definitely a, a great idea. So now it's up to you also to join. I, I was thinking I just bypass now from Joe to Thomas and say why is it a good idea, but I think now it's a good time also for beer. So I think uh, where is uh, our caterer? I see him also. There's beer available. Oh, it's already there. There's wine available, beer available. Think about this idea, and you're very welcome to put on the list and also to talk with us here. There are good reasons for and be part of the founders, you know? Founders is something special, and later a number something is something, but the founders is uh, time now. Good, close? Yeah, then be close, thanks. Ah. And later also, about 2030, 20, 2030, there's an Eschenbräu, but you can have the first beer here. You can take the routing, as we know, on the way, more beer, but start with the first beer here. 